Peace. <laughs> and I need to apologize for earlier. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. It's like all of a sudden, everything that we were going to use to bring the show for uh, financial literacy and uh, financial information just all of a sudden didn't work on Facebook for some reason. I don't, I don't know what happened. The creation of the rooms and everything, it was just weird that all of a sudden it just did not work. So um, what we're going to do, and please keep uh, an eye out what we're going to do. I spoke to Miss Massey. We're going to do a Zoom meeting because... This platform just uh, its one of the reasons why I'm not going to be doing the show here, excuse me, anymore. Because it's so many limitations. Like, you just can't do what, what it is you need to do. Hey. So, um, you know, uh, freedom of expression. you got to be able to talk about some things. And they offer these tools and then it doesn't work. It's just, like, so weird. So, we're going to talk about the other things that I have been watching. And I hope that you guys are... Uh, <laughs> You're going to have to bear with me with a lot of this stuff because I feel like I'm in school again. Like trying to find out all this information and my reason for trying to find out all this information is just because of this. We need to have these conversations. There's no way that we can afford to uh, consider somebody's feelings anymore. It's not about considering anyone else's feelings anymore. We can no longer afford to uh, sit idly by. We can no longer say, well, you know, well, they got it or they're going to do it. Everybody needs to take a portion that they can handle and do their part. Um, so, there was something I was watching the other night and I came across this quote by the 12th president of the United States, James Garfield. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a direct quote from the 12th president of the United States. I have a strong feeling of repugnance when I think of the Negro becoming our political equal, and I would be glad if they could be colonized, sent to heaven, or got rid of in any decent way. I don't know about anyone else, but it gets really, really difficult for anybody to believe that first of all it's not intentional second um it's not a system that's in place that that is uh designed to do this and it is systems that are in place and that is some of the things that i have been because i don't like to feel like for, there's no other way to say it. i don't like to feel like i'm crazy i don't like to feel like you know i'm imagining there's somebody doing this doing something to me mm, no all of these colored folk in this country are not imagining what is happening this that's that's not what happening that's not that's not what's happening but what is strange to me is that we take it um i'm gonna post later i'm gonna post uh, my watch list from amazon prime because I think that's the best way for you guys to see what it is where I get this information from. So you can watch it for yourself and, you know, you can do the research and find out, you know, where this stuff comes from. Because in this country, there is always going to be a W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, depending on which country you're in. Um, as he so eloquently stated, um, it's always going to be the problem of the color line. Always. There's, there's, there's always going to be that problem and part of the problem is because the color line has been written into law and has been um something that we accept so readily because it's been a part of our upbringing we've been taught like when we look back at our at our uh maybe your grandparents generation or maybe just just as far as their parents your grandparents parents your great grandparents generation and you see some of the things that they had to endure and you wonder to yourself and you go oh i couldn't have done that well yeah you would have and the reason you would have just like we are doing now is because it was made normal at that time it was made normal this was what was happening so this is what people accepted and as i watch these documentaries and these people from these eras um discuss the things that happened to them many of them um say the same thing they say you know that's just the way it was you know that's 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 what we had to deal with and that's what they dealt with but here is something that i don't understand 
things like that were given to us that we obviously have a choice in, like our religion. Let's go with religion for a minute. Religion. So many of us, if you were like, if you have any uh, of my background, if you, most of the people you grew up with were Baptist, Christian, uh, Methodist, AME, some sort of Protestant religion. Many of us um, grew up in Baptist churches or holiness churches or Pentecostal churches or some church where they praise Jesus. And in many of those churches, the figures that we saw, if there was any imagery at all, many of those figures did not look like us. So when we walk as a, as, a, as a kid, you know, you don't take stock of it, but you do notice it. You do see the pictures. You do notice that they do not look like you. But how do you, as a kid, you don't have the tools to get through that. You don't have the tools to ask the question about why doesn't it look like me? Why are we sitting in this church with, the, with these images of people who don't look like us? And that's on purpose. The people who gave you that religion gave you their images so that you would worship them. Because once, you, once we have you worshiping images, we tell you that the God that you worship looks like us. So when you pray... And I wore these on both wrists like this, so to push, like shackles, because this is what that prayer situation is. This is what that prayer situation is. This shackle. This, if you if you look at the police handcuffs now, and you see the shackles, it's just like this. Your hands were only able to go like this. And when you're begging for your life, you tend to put your hands like this, or like this. Yeah, I said it. So, we sit and we look at all these images that don't look like us. And, you know, many of us are dragged into these buildings from very early on. And if you don't explain these images, it can, as a, some kids, you know, it can be a terrifying place until, and, and especially if it's your first time, when it is your first time, like if you didn't go as a baby, so you're not acclimated to how these people act, and then you get, you get there around, let's say three, four, and all of a sudden some woman falls out and you have no idea what is going on, or some other woman is like shouting in place and she looks like she's possessed, and you have no idea what these things mean. It can be very shocking. It can be very traumatizing. In addition to the fact that none of these images that I'm worshiping now look like me. None of this stuff is familiar. None of this stuff is working. None of this stuff is the type of... And, and, and parents, I don't think parents do a very good job of explaining because the parents don't have a good idea. The reason parents don't have a good idea is because of this thing that, that we have that a lot of people uh, misinterpret called faith. That little thing called faith, that, that thing they tell you, you got to have a mustard seed of, you got to have the mustard seed of faith if you want to get anything done. Here's the situation though. When you, um, when all your answers are attributed to faith, when, when the answer is always faith, you never get to any answers. Because there are some things that actually have answers. But you're not going to get to those answers. Because they're going to tell you, you're asking too many questions, you don't have faith, you have to give it to God. God, he created it, he moves in mysterious ways. And all of this nonsense and boogie stuff that we were taught to believe in is a bunch of misinterpreted... Um, allegory that if it were used properly would have a wonderful place in the world but we have not used it we have used those books as tools of hate we have used them to keep people oppressed and that's what that's what i think is the weird thing to me is how you can continue to worship in a religion that was given to you in oppression continues to keep you oppressed keeps your mind oppressed in that it doesn't want you to look for answers doesn't that smack of like when the slave owner said no we don't want you to read we don't want you to find out certain information it's just a whole different twist on it it's not just about with this now they've taken it okay so we have to let you read and write all right so we're going to let you read and write but what we're going to tell you we're going to make you not want to 
because we're going to make it seem like the more information you find out, the less faith you have. And I think that's so bizarre. Now, here's the other part of that thing. If we were, um, if somebody asked you about, let's say, African spirituality, and you would say, oh, that's hocus pocus or voodoo, you would say, you know, so many people are, they ascribe anything that's black and out of this country, all the same. It's either African or Haitian, so they would say it's voodoo or something like that, you know. So, you ask them about an African spirituality and, you know, they dismiss it. But you will go to church and believe that a spirit from the sky impregnated a virgin who then had a baby that walked on water, brought people back from the dead, and then himself rose from the dead. You'll believe that. But the stuff that people had practiced for hundreds and thousands of years prior to the civilization that kidnapped you from the land where you originated and all the civilization originated, the stuff that was practiced there for thousands of years um, and taken away, stripped away from you, you won't believe that. But you'll believe what was given to you when you got here. That's just like the pig feet. It's just like the chitlins. It's the nastiest most disgusting part left over that they give us to digest and we take it. It's the same thing. They give us the things that nobody else will eat. They give us the parts that nobody else wants. They give us all of the things that are least desirable in society. And see, here's the thing. This was my arrogance and being an, uh, an African-American man. I, I'm, I'm, I can be quite arrogant in believing that all the attacks are against me. Not specifically me, but people, you know, the so-called black people. No. I was watching a documentary on um, Amazon Prime, and it talked about, you know, when Columbus came over. Now, we don't, and everybody knows he was a pirate. But it's amazing what happens when you ask Italian-American people, like, don't you think that we should take down some of the images of Columbus and not... Uh, worship, uh, you know, not because it is kind of worshipful to have all these idols up, but anyway, but shouldn't we like take that stuff down? Because what he actually did was he brought death, uh, pillage, rape, piracy, dismemberment, uh, pedophilia. Let's not forget that because they were raping the little Tainos that were there when they uh, came back on, I think it's the fourth trip, and they were in the Caribbean after they had came over here to the mainland. Um, they were raping those little girls, and they would hang them. And this is what they would do in the name of Jesus. What they would do is they would take 12 of them and hang them with an extra one, making it 13 that they would hang together in honor of Jesus. Because what they did, they this was the, this was, this was the thought. Anybody who did not believe in Jesus was one, not human, two, worthy of servitude, and should serve those who were Christian. So it didn't begin as a whole white thing. It didn't begin as a white thing. It began as a Christian thing. Because they used the Bible to justify putting all these people in slavery. They needed a justification other than they were operating under the edicts of, you know, the... Um, kings and queens of Europe but they also needed something more more um, they needed more basically they needed more something that they could use as a as a greater tool because after you know later when you know they fought for independence and everything so it was no longer about the monarchy it was now about we need a higher power to ordain all of this so what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these ideas and they are now ordained they they they're ordained by God but again they came over and they took the uh they used the religion as because the Bible is the guru is listen when one of the documentaries one of the um theolo well, not theologians he's one of the um 
he's an uh, educator at one of the universities. I forget his name, but he said, you know, in reference to the Bible, he said the a Bible, the Bible is a tool because what they were trying to figure out was is the Bible a racist uh, document? And his thing was, it's not a racist document. It is a tool, however. And people who use that tool can, you know, you can hammer to the right or you can hammer to the left. You can hammer up or you can hammer down. But it's a tool. It's not, the it, it in and of itself is not a bad thing is what he was saying. I tend to disagree. But his thing was, you know, it's just a tool. And whoever gets hold of the tool, whoever is wielding this tool, is going to use that tool to then, you know, oppress. Can, well, he didn't say that. I'm saying this. But because it is a tool, you can then use that tool as a tool of oppression because that was one of the other things that is it, it is the greatest um, tool. If you want to justify any of the things that have been done to us in this country, all you got to do is whip out that book. That is why I do not understand why we think it's okay to still carry that book. I do not understand how we still think that that book is something of value. Because as another young lady said, you can separate church and God. Which you can separate God and the Bible. Just because there are plenty of books that mention God in them. But nobody brings them to the altar on Sunday to read from those books. And there's probably more truth in, in them about God than this Bible thing that everybody got in the house on the shelf collecting dust. So we have now taken this tool that has been used for centuries as our tool of oppression. And it is now our greatest source of strength and courage. Which makes no sense. But we do that. As a people, we do that. We take the things that have been used against us. We take the things that, like the word nigger. Took off the ER, threw on an AH, and now we call, it, call each other. I'm not saying that's good or bad. What I'm saying is it is a demystification of the word from its original meaning so we, what we have done in essence is repackaged it for our purpose, which is a good thing because that way, if you take it and use it, what, what, what we thought was that if we took it and use it, nobody else can use it against us. That was the thinking behind that. If you take the word and use it, it doesn't hurt as much. We have found that that is not true, unfortunately. It is the intent behind the word when it is being said. That is what hurts. It is not whether we say it or whether they say it. It's who's saying it and why. Because I can call, I can walk up to every last one of my friends and say, nigga what? Nigga, nigga. And nobody is going to think anything untoward. But if my skin were this, it would be a situation. Rightly so. So, Yeah, so we have to begin to look at these things that let me say this if somebody controls your mind they don't have to do anything else to you all they got to do is put in what they want right in here and the rest you're going to do and that is what has been done to us. And what kills me a lot of times is that we see this over and often and often and over that this is what has been done to us. Are we angry yet? This is how they're doing us. Are we angry yet? Not enough. And the reason why I don't think that we're angry enough is because we continue to go to church. And listen, if you go to church and you are edified and you go and you make a wonderful life that's a wonderful thing i'm not saying that it's not what i'm saying is i think you could do that whether you went there or not i don't think you need the book i don't think you need the book the book has some wonderful things i'm not saying i'm not saying that it's a bad book what i'm saying is you do not need that book to be what it is and who you need to be in this life and I also think that because that book has been used as a tool for our 
oppression, suppression, demise, destruction, demoralization. I would just say let's get rid of the book. There are plenty of other books. I read a book. There's a book that I downloaded into my phone. In 66 pages, this book has done more for me. And I ain't even going to tell y'all what it is. Because most of you have heard about this book. You've heard about some type of it. And I sent many of you the link to it. To download it for free online. So, anyway. So, in 66 pages, this book has done more for my life. In terms of clarity thinking. And just making me want to be a better human being. Than that book. Or any other book sent uh, before, prior. They don't have to control your thinking anymore because they have your churches to do it for you. They have your pastor in place to do it for you. They have all that to do it for you. And here's the other thing with um, using the Bible and God to justify. You know, slavery and violence and things like that. Um, when they brought... First of all, let me ask you if y'all have ever heard of a man called John Phillips. John Phillips was a slave. But he was a slave who was christened in, in over in uh, England before he came here. He was christened. Probably by whoever owned him. I'm, I'm going to say. John Phillips, there was a court case where... Um, John Phillips was a witness. Now, of course, blacks can't testify, particularly at that time, they couldn't testify against their owners or any other white men who were landowners, I think, at that time. So they did allow this one to testify. The reason that they allowed him to testify was because he had been christened in England and because he wasn't testifying against his owner. But they, he was testifying against someone else. But he was allowed to testify only because he was christened. So in this great land of ours, where there is such a separation of church and state, how is it that we have not called for a revision of the laws of the land in which God is codified as well? <laughs> as well as the oppression of people of color. How is it that we have not called for this to be the, the documents to be ripped up and revised. How, how is it that we have not called for that? We sit idly by every day and we do exactly now what our ancestors did then. We go, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Yeah, they were protesting marches then. And this is as far as we got. We still die in the streets because we have not changed the thinking in this country. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> when you talk about oppressing a people, of course, when you have oppression, there's the oppressor and the oppressed, right? So, if God looks like you, right? If God looks like you, you are then chosen by God. Because remember, it says in this book that we were made in God's image. So, if you get to choose what God looks like, God looks like you. Now we're going to make all these people who don't look like us worship this God that looks like me or you. We get all these people with color to worship this God that looks nothing like them. So now every time that they see you, they think of God. How many times have you seen a white man with long hair? I know in the 60s it was rampant. How many times have you seen a white man with long hair just even like he's a kid? He looks just like Jesus. Oh my God, he looks like Jesus. Now we know that that's not, if there is was a man called Jesus, that's probably the last thing that he looked like because people in that region don't look like that. They look like us. So, you know, once they have you worship them, that makes them supreme beings, right? And then you wonder where that's where white supremacy comes from. From the whole notion that I am supreme because I look like God. You don't. So I get to, just like all the other beasts of burden and the foul and filth of 
the earth, the creep, the things that creep and crawl upon the earth and whatever else the book says. I get to lord over you now because I look like God. Yeah, it's a lot of propaganda. But when do we dismantle the propaganda? How do we not see? I was watching y'all. My friends laugh at me mostly because, well, because I'm stupid, but because I'm always relating things to what to something else. Like if there's a song, I'm a, and I hear something, I'm gonna call out the rest of the lyrics. If you say something and there's some lyrics that got that, I'm gonna finish the rest of the song. If there's a movie and there's a scene in the movie, I got to send you the scene of the movie that relates to what it was we was talking about. So I was watching Spider Man, not the Tobey Maguire version, the new version, the new version, the the uh, Avengers version, Spider Man. And there's one thing that my man said, and you know, you know how things like keep, like, you feel like some, some, like, I feel like somebody's trying to tell, you know, in the color purple, see, I'm going to do it now. In the color purple, they say, y'all seen God's trying to tell you something. I felt like God was trying to tell me something, because every time I turned on my stupid TV, this movie was on. So I would watch it, and I didn't realize what it was I was supposed to be looking at. I've seen this movie can't tell you how many times I love this movie. And every time it comes on, if I can watch it, I'm going to watch it. If I ain't doing nothing else and there's nothing better on, I'm going to watch this Spider-Man. Uh, this is the homecoming. No, that... Okay, I read one. No, it's when they're in Europe. That one. So, he's in Europe and he's fighting uh, Mysterio. Right? And Spider-Man has finally figured out that the big uh, elementals monster that he has uh, been encountering in Europe is nothing but an illusion. And so Happy, who is uh, uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark, who was his head of security, Happy. Happy says, so what are you going to do? And he says, thank you, far from home. Um, so he says, so what are you going to do? And he says... Well, it's just an illusion. So once I get on the inside of the illusion, I can take him down. So, I hope y'all get what I'm trying to say. Like I said, if you were watching, not the earlier show, where I was trying to, hoping trying to get to the financial situation, but, um, oh, that just, I lost my train of thought is what just happened because I got frustrated about what happened earlier with the last week. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm hoping we can uh, think about taking the illusion down. Oh, that's where I was going. There was an analogy made in one of, um, and you can watch these, these, these documentaries at your leisure. For some reason, nothing on TV is as good as these documentaries are me right now. Um, where one of the educators says, once you realize that there were no roots to the tree, you then realize that, you know, all the branches and everything fall off, everything else from that tree falls away. This whole construct has no roots, except what they've be, been able to make. We have to get right beneath those roots, beneath the uh, hologram, beneath the uh, whatever, the mask, the smoke and mirrors, and get under that, which is the paperwork, and get to that. And that's where a lot of that needs to be changed. It's not going to change until that changes. But the root of that is, like I said, it's fear. a much more difficult um, thing to change. You know, I was watching. <laughs> I tell you, there's some good stuff out there. If you if you if you're looking for this stuff, and what you know, once you watch the once you watch the movie, then it comes up. You know, the rest of them come up. Um, 
more like this or whatever, right? So then you get an opportunity, and that's what that's what will keep happening. And that's what that's how I fell into this rabbit hole. Honestly, that's how I fell into the rabbit hole. So um, there was something that I was just looking at that um, oh, it was this document. <laughs> This tickles me. I'm sorry. This documentary on uh, white couples who adopted black chil children of color, not necessarily black, but children of color, because some of them had some were mixed with other things. In Utah, Mormon country. Yeah, you heard me. Hit me in the pocket. Y'all can laugh at that, cause that's some funny stuff. Why are these white people out here trying to adopt these black kids? Well, I've already watched it for you, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and it's, it's funny to me because when you discount people's experiences so much, you end up with their problems. That's, that's what normally happens. When you discount people's experiences so much, you are going to end up with their problems. And these white people have um, adopted these children of color. And the reason that they adopted these children of color, it wasn't that they were trying to, um, it wasn't that they did it intentionally. It wasn't like they set out to intentionally adopt, adopt the chil adopt children of color because, or for some, for some nefarious reasons. These were couples who, for whatever reason, had trouble having children of their own. And, you know, that as you get older, you get more, you, you realize you're, you, you want to spend your best years with your kid. So you don't want to be too old having kids. So, you know, they had got to their point where they adopted, you know, these children. These children were children of color. For various reasons, these, these just bad ideas. But what it shined a light on to me was when people who have not shared your experience discount your experience that's what i was trying to get to and there are a lot of people and i found when when black people say it it makes my ass itch but when white people say it i just go when they say i don't see color because that says so much you think you're saying something nice by telling me that you um, don't see color, but what you're really actually admitting to me is you don't have experience with my color. What you're admitting to me is you don't know how my color is treated. What you are admitting to me is that you don't believe that there's a race problem in this country because you like to see everything the same. That's what you are admitting to me when you say, I don't see color. And these people were those type of people. They were, oh, I don't see color. It doesn't matter what kind. We just want to have a kid. We'll love whoever you send our way. And yeah, they you can love a kid. But can you love all the circumstances that those kids are going to go through that you cannot explain that are completely outside of your experience because you have lived such a homogenized life that what you are experiencing now has turned your entire world upside down? Are you ready for that? Because that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. These people, oh, first of all, the little kids went to school and had been called nigger for years and had no idea that what was being said was one, racist, two, bad, three, their parents had no clue. For years sometimes. One little boy, his parents finally asked him and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, this is after they have a discussion about it in school and, you know, he's coming home with homework and they're doing schoolwork at the dinner table and he's sitting there and he goes, uh, the, you know, the parents go, well, yeah, what do you, have you thought about what you want to be? And the, the little black boy the, to his white parents says, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have to figure out what you can do in jail. And he's dead serious. He's dead serious. And the parents are like, what? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what you can do in jail. I'm, since I haven't been yet, I don't know what you can do in jail. And they're like, what, what, why, why, why would you need to, uh, where's this from? What, what, what do you mean? It goes, well, at school they told me that I'm going to end up in jail. So I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do in jail. But the parents had no idea because they don't see color. So you don't know to ask these questions. You don't know 
to interrogate your child or what tools to give them because you don't see color. You don't know what tools to arm your child with. This little child that you, oh, I'm going to love him, I'm going to care for him. It feels like, you know, that whole Bugs Bunny, I'm going to love him and squeeze him and, and pet him and call him George. Y'all sound that stupid when you do something like that. You have no idea what we go through you have, because you have no idea what you've put us through. That's why. And, you know, I put something up on my page, I think it was earlier, and it says, you know, karma is, you know, you finding out what you did, how that feels. Something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing, but you get it. So there will come a time when you get all that back. As a society, though, as a culture, as a group, there will come a time when you get all that back. Because, see, the other thing, there was another family, and they had, you know, this one uh, little girl, and... It, So, y'all are, are vitamin D milk white, right? Y'all are, y'all a whole gallon of milk, this family. Y'all go get this little girl from the depths of Ethiopia. Hair, y'all have never, the only place you've touched that texture is on a sweater or a Brillo pad. You've never touched this texture before. You have no idea what to do with it. You have no idea that if you there's certain chemicals that you're gonna not chemicals but certain uh, creams and things that you put on it that'll lay it down smooth and you don't have to do all of this that that, that. and y'all don't know that but then you have two other little white girls okay so now you have your little blended family thing but your little white girls and your little white community and your little white family gets to go to school with all the little white friends and they get to disappear into the crowd, away from this one. And they don't have to come back together again until y'all get home. That child is alone, even in the house. There's no safe place. There is no safe space for this black child in her black family, in her black school, in her, no, I'm sorry, in her white school, in her white family with her white family, this black child with her white family, this black child in her white school, this... And the thing was, here's how some of them ended up with these, 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 these kids. Darker children are discounted. At least through this one particular agency that they were interviewing with in Utah. I won't speak across the board. But I think that is, and it's, it's I forget what type of pricing they call it, but there is a scale the color scale with the kids because these kids are more desirable and the further you get away from this the less people are willing to spend for those children so these were families who had done in vitro and they had uh you know spent a lot of money doing all these other different things and trying to have kids in, in, in so many different other ways and so they were just short of broke they were running out of money they didn't have the money that they once had to be able to put towards this kid and so when you get to this and you see you know well you know I can get a kid I just want a kid after a while it's just I want a kid I just want a kid I don't care look oh, I this one is less look this one might need more love so you start rationalizing and justifying and it's like going to Walmart now you have less money these kids are less so you know you're gonna get the kid that costs less because they're all kids they all need love and you rationalize and you justify in your homogenized life you rationalize and justify all of these things and you take this kid out of this orphanage and you pat yourself on the back, you and your wife, because now you're a hero. You have rescued a kid like you would rescue a dog. And you have brought this kid into your home and you're going to love it and squeeze it and pet it and you're going to call it George. And you have taken it from its culture and its identity, from its life. And this is what, this I love this part. Here's the part. Yeah, oh, these, these kids, they come from, you know, such hard backgrounds and, you know, the mother was a drug addict. 
working, but they were reaching out to other states, not just in Utah. Y'all wanted to make sure that you had enough of these little Walmart babies to fill all of these Mormons. Because remember, the Mormon religion, part of the Mormon religion is having a big family. You they, they don't believe in birth control. However many kids God wants you to have, because it's ordained that you have kids. So, you have to have kids. And if you don't, it is your fault. So, whatever you got to do to have kids, you have kids. And once they start, you know, once they realize they couldn't have kids, they needed to have kids. Because they're in this Mormon community and every single other person that they know has kids. So again, you get the slave owner who go pick up a slave, and I'm I'm not saying that in the vein of that's what that's what's happening is slavery. That's not what I'm saying. I'm sure that these parents love their kids. What I'm saying is there's a whole lot more to be thought about, and part of the thinking we need to do is start making sure that this country is better for these kids. It's incumbent upon us. Like, we already owe the next generation an apology. Because we haven't gotten this right yet. Here's what I don't understand. I don't work. So, before you ask yourself the question that I'm going to ask you about me, that's your answer. I don't understand how everybody can get up and go to work. Every day. Because it doesn't, it wouldn't take but so many, I don't think. Everybody looking at me now going, yeah, you can say that because your ass at home. I've taken days off to do shit like that. Y'all, you, you just uh, you get to know me better. Um, but <laughs> my thing is, you, you, most of the people watching are parents and grandparents. How, how, how much longer do, is, is, how many more generations of your progeny do y'all want to go through this? I'm trying to figure that out. That's what I can't figure out. I know our great grandparents um, will probably look at what we have now and be like, "Oh my God, you've come a long way." Some, some of them saw the bigger picture. Uh, many of them saw the bigger picture. They saw that this is not how, still not how this country is supposed to be. This is not where we should be at um, in the social and economic, because they go hand in hand development of this country. Um, But um, they keep us busy. They keep you busy from from the time you first start forming your own thoughts. They keep you busy, which is just after kindergarten, just after your parents can teach you enough to walk and talk, so that there's there's less for them to do. You know, that's when they they get their hands kind of on on us. You know, and it, it's indoctrination for the next however many years you're in school. Because learning doesn't begin until you, you finish school. That's when learning actually begins. Learning doesn't take place in school. That's indoctrination. You sit there and it's indoctrination and memorization, depending on your teacher. There are some teachers out there who I've had some magnificent people who taught. It's one of the reasons why I do this now. It's like Lenora Brazel Rothwa. If you've never heard that name again, you've heard it today. Um, Lenora Brazel Rothwa was my theater teacher. I may have mentioned her before. I think I may have. Um, she's always worth mentioning because she is the person who gave me my passion to speak about issues like social issues and things like that. Because when I entered arts high school, in 19 something whatever that was and sitting in her classroom and she said to us one day she said y'all are so stupid you don't even know when you're being insulted and I decided that was the last day that somebody was gone ever ever have an opportunity to say that to me and it be true 
she gave me a love for uh, black music. And I'm not talking about hip hop and rap. She gave me the origins of hip hop and rap by teaching uh, me to love Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington at 14 years old, listening to A-Train in room 210 in Arts High School, uh, listening to Ella Fitzgerald scat to the A-Train. Shadab daba do ya dab shep shaba do ya daba ooh ya koo, ooh ya kay, shadoom doom dweedin bob shep shaba dab shep baba do do ow. Oh, I fell in love with my people. And when she told us that, you remember, y'all remember McDonald's Mac the Knife? Remember the guy with the moon head? When she played that, you know, gave us the lyrics to the actual music that they got that from. And it was um, a, the, the, guy, the character um, Mac the Knife was a rapist and a murderer. And here's McDonald's who takes this figure who's, you know, a horrible guy. It has every all these kids singing about him. And that's the old switcheroo that has been done to us time and time again throughout history. Time and time again throughout history. The thing that it's like, and, and they do it right in front of our face. And sometimes you just don't know whether you're being insulted or not. Like, you just can't know. Sometimes you can't know, but it's made to be that way. It's a design to be that way. Um, I know plenty of you are my age and older, some of you, and you've heard about things like COINTELPRO and um, how the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover conspired to uh, make sure that the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Panther parties and things like that were destroyed because they knew that the black community galvanized was a dangerous thing. They knew that we could take over and they knew that we had the intelligence. They knew that we had the economic resources. They knew that we had the labor force. They knew that we had everything we needed self-contained and we had proved it many, many times throughout history over and over again to do it ourselves. And because they did not want to be without that labor force, they made us, they destroyed our leaders. They would always find our leaders, which always disenfranchised us, which always scattered us. You kill King, you kill Martin, you kill Stokely, you kill, you know, you chase them out of the country and make them go into exile on the continent of Africa and various countries, Liberia, and Nigeria, and everything like that. And then you're like, uh-huh, yeah, what y'all gonna do? Y'all gonna sit here and y'all gonna work for us. And when a pandemic virus hits, we're gonna send you back out and we're gonna call you essential workers. We're not gonna call you slaves anymore. We're gonna call you essential workers now. But you're gonna go to work for us. We need you to be at work. Because... CEOs weren't coming into work. CFOs were not coming into work. It was the labor force who came to work and who constitutes the labor force. And I'm I'm saying this, and it's not a, I'm not trying to demean all of our um, like EMS workers and firemen and policemen and all of us. You know, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to take a look at the people who are most at risk. Throughout history, though. Because that's just the truth. It's not me making an insinuation. It is just the freaking truth. It's none of that. So once you know that, you can't help but see that this is it's this way. You cannot help but see that it is this way. And if that does not infuriate you to the point of wanting to stop everything you are doing for the sake of your children, I don't know what else to say to you. Um, I'm trying to figure out from all the lies that we are told, from all the things that we are fed, at what point do we decide to just teach the truth? They have got us so used to not telling the truth. Look at your relationships. How many people in your life can you walk up to? And no matter what you're feeling, some of your most shameful things, some of your most intimate thoughts, how many people in your life can you right now walk up to and tell all of your dirty laundry to? All of your secrets, all the things that you never wanted to tell, the things that you would take to the grave. They teach us to keep those type of things secret. When those are things that all of us think and all of us do and all of us say, it, it, just because it's in here doesn't mean that it doesn't happen out here. 
But if they keep you focused on that type of stuff, you can't see, you know, what you could really accomplish. They keep you focused on the things like uh, the busy work. They make you get more stuff so that you can take care of more stuff, so that you got to do more things to take care of all these things. It's it's a cycle that is created so that you never see the man behind the mirror or behind the curtain or whoever he is right now. He could be anywhere. He can be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so we have to begin to change our perspective if we are going to change anything. We cannot be afraid. There's one thing that I want to just... Uh, never mind. Last thought, and, and I'm going to get out of here. Last thought, and I'm going to get out of here. Um, please know that everything that happens here is a system. Okay. There are systems in place. It's, it's almost like a computer program. There's software systems running. There's hardware systems running. You are downloading stuff at the same time. There's stuff running in the foreground. There's stuff running in the background. Um, there's all these systems that are... Uh, running all over the place so it makes it difficult to try and pinpoint which system it is you need to focus on I get that I get that once we let go of the mental slavery thank you Eurydices um, once we let go of that mental slavery it'll be a whole lot easier when I say mental slavery, I am talking about um, look for God outside of your religion and see where you find him. That's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to take away your religion. Look for God outside of your religion and see where you find him. Start there. We have to begin to uh, look at what it is we're teaching, what it is that's worth teaching. Uh, ask yourself, why are you still a part of certain systems? Why? What does it serve you to be a part of that system? And if that system is giving it to you, can you get it from another system? I'm trying to tell you, it's just a little, um, it's worth, it's worth investigating. Um, there was something that I'm looking for. Give me one second. Oh, I think that was it. Yeah. So, the reason I say, oh, uh, I was talking about the systems. Because there's so much that we teach children in school. We make them go through test after test. And, and it's very stressful for these kids, I'm sure. I would not want to be in school. Not in coming up in you know, primary school, uh, high school, or anything like that today, I really wouldn't. They have, are tested, and all the rest of these things, and some of it, mm, I just think that there's better things we're teaching. So, but insofar as history is concerned, I want you to take a look at this, um, just this idea. The lies that they feed your kids from the time they get in the first grade all the way up through 12th grade. We'll just stop at 12th grade. College is a little different. Sometimes you can kind of pick some things and you'll get some more, some teachers who have a little bit more latitude about teaching the truth. But from the first grade through the 12th grade, the lies that they teach your kids, you're, you then have you either you or your child probably in conjunction, are going to have to spend that time, equal amounts of time, if not more, unlearning all of that. Here's how deliberate this thing is. They could take history out of school altogether if they're going to teach you lies. But they would rather teach you lies. They would, ra and, and, and it, this is the most frustrating part. There are a bunch of parents who went through school We're fed those lies, realize they were lies, learn the truth, and then we'll send their same kids to those same schools to learn those same lies to have to repeat that process all over again as opposed to saying, look, 
what you're teaching is not historically accurate. We're going to deal with it either in the moment. My kid is going to come to school and challenge you on everything that you're saying because either you're going to teach the truth or you're not going to teach my kid. We have to begin to tell the truth. But I just want you to think about how deliberate that is. As opposed to telling, you could, you could say nothing. You could say absolutely nothing. But you choose to tell the lie. That's how despicable it is. So as y'all are out here walking through these streets, if you should happen to stumble on your way, remember that the harder you fall, the higher you bounce. I'm real devious. I'm going to get out of here. Um, look for the Zoom meeting with Tamika Massey. Uh, she and I will be doing it this Friday at 9 p.m. Uh, it is going to be about financial literacy, so bring your questions because she's going to be answering questions. We're going to be taking questions. We will not be constrained by time or, you know, anything like that. We're just going to go in and try and, you know, answer as much as possible and help everybody out because that's the other thing. The more literate we get about our finances and things like that, the more control we have over, you, you know how that goes. Because, again, that document was written for landowners. They were of a specific color at that time. But there are people included in that color now who were not included then. So we might need to include people into our color that historically we may not have included. All people of color. We need to stop letting uh, culture, language, we need to understand that there is a detriment in this country to all of us. Maybe not equally, but definitely all of us certainly. What affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Reverend Martin Luther King said that. So, please know that. Don't think that because you sit home and there are other people doing stuff that it'll get done. And da, 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 da. Don't think that it doesn't affect you because it's affecting them. I just, it's coming. Your turn is coming. So either you can join it and get in and, and we can all do this together. Because here's the other thing. Shh, I'm just telling you all. Something I really liked about, uh, unfortunately, you know, not unfortunately, but, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. We have to watch what we call ourselves because how they, how we, how they uh, define us is how they're going to divide us. What categories? Black is a people who there's no black person that's a person with no land who came from no land that's what that is a black person it's a person with no land it's like a black mark we don't know where you're from that's what black people are that's why i said the so-called black man but um um we need to start co uh coalition co uh unifying that's the word we need to start unifying Coalescing. We need to start coming together. Whatever the word is in your head, if I said it wrong, fuck it, you know what I mean. That's what we need to start doing. Go make a new friend. Somebody who's not your color, but who's definitely a person of color. Okay? And I'll take back with y'all. I'm out of here. I'm real devious. I'm tired. Thank y'all for watching. I love you for listening. And I've been telling the motherfuckers you all so fucking stupid with this bullshit religion that the word demon and the word melanin is the fucking same. And can you can understand why the damn government can give you a religion? Because when you go up in the church and you are scared of demons, you are scared of your own substance, which is melanin. I've been talking about this for years, but we got to break it down in scientific terminology for you. In your blood system is these microscopic elements. I've been talking about this before. We got to break it down. Is demon, damionic substances. I'm talking scientific, but you have let someone come in with this religious bullshit and fuck up your blueprint of your higher levels of scientists, science because you are scared based on your indoctrination. The word Damien, the word, you get the word Amen, which means hidden, hidden substance. You get the word Amen, 